If you've bought a Mac within the last decade, you'll know that Apple charges a premium for storage. At minimum, you're looking at $200 increments where a standard internal storage drive costs less than half that. But there's also one other problem. Those drives are not replaceable, so not only are you stuck with whatever capacity you choose when you buy the Mac, but on most of them, if your storage dies, so does your computer. And that's where these little guys come in. External SSDs can not only save you some money and reduce the wear on your machine, but they're also great for backups and can give you a lot more flexibility in terms of moving files around between different Macs or even with some cross-platform setups. Something that's become pretty essential in a lot of workflows. That being said, not all SSD drives are created equal, and the market is flooded with options that range from dirt cheap thumb drives all the way up to high-end Thunderbolt 5 SSDs. And figuring out what makes sense for your setup can be pretty overwhelming, and today I want to try and help clear that up a little. I'm going to dive into budget-friendly options all the way up to premium solutions, cover what specs actually matter, and touch on things like compatibility, temperature levels, and power draw. So if you're looking to expand your Mac storage without paying Apple's prices, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. I've been using external storage with my Macs for years. I've usually got at least one portable SSD hooked up at my desk at all times that I work from, and over the years I've not only learned what works best for me, but I've gotten a ton of questions and concerns from you guys, which I think are worth addressing. Also, like all these types of videos, nothing here is sponsored. These are all products that I've bought and tested myself that I will link in the description, but you can apply most of what's in here to similar products. So. Let's just dive in. The first items that I want to talk about are the most affordable options out there where you're going to see prices range from just over 50 bucks USD to around 150 or so. These usually come in the form of portable drives like the ones that I have here, or you can buy an enclosure and put a regular internal SSD in yourself if you want to. But there are some things that you need to look out for here. The first being the USB version. USB versioning is an absolute mess. You'll see USB 3.1 or 3.2, USB 3.1 Gen 2, 3.2 Gen 2, all of which can mean the same thing. So. My advice is just to ignore that and look at the transfer speed itself. For these portable SSDs specifically, they're going to run on USB 3.2 Gen 2 and advertise a max transfer speed in the neighborhood of 1000 megabytes per second, where in reality they'll run between 650 and 950 megabytes per second on both read and write speeds. But still, at those speeds they're going to cover 75 to 90 percent of people's needs. In fact, you're probably not going to notice a huge difference between these and your max internal storage for most tasks. They're definitely not quite as fast, but they can handle things like editing raw photos or videos like mine, running games, compiling code, all kinds of stuff. The nice thing about these drives is you can just buy them and they're ready to go without any additional steps or assembly and the two specific ones that I recommend are the Samsung T7 and the Crucial X9 Pro for a few reasons. For one, they're both really reliable products and these drives in particular have great build quality. Both have an aluminum construction which is good for durability but also with heat dissipation which can be a super important metric to be aware of. SSDs can run hot, and while the max operating temperatures hover between 75 and 85 degrees Celsius, temperatures that sit just below that can affect speed and lifespan. Personally, I've had cheap plastic SSDs fail from overheating, but under load, these ones stay under 40 degrees with zero issues after years of use. They're also lightweight with small form factors. The X9 Pro is the smaller of the two and it does have an IP55 rating, so if you're exposed to the elements often that might be the better option, but honestly they're both outstanding. They also draw very little power. Each draws less than 4 watts under load, which if you're running a MacBook on battery power will maybe result in it draining 1-2 to two hours faster than usual, but is going to have far less impact on battery life than almost every other option here. 
Now, beyond those portable drives, NVMe enclosures are kind of a neat option. Those are gonna take these M.2 2280 internal drives that you would normally stick in a PC and turn them into portable storage, and they do have some benefits. For starters, enclosures around that same 1000 megabyte speed are super inexpensive. This Ugreen one that I have here costs less than 20 bucks and combined with a sub $50 NVMe internal drive, you'll get a cheaper solution that will outperform both of those portable drives and you can swap drives as needed, which is nice. That being said, there's no real improvement when it comes to drive speeds. You might see an extra one or 200 megabytes per second in tests, but real world use will feel largely the same. There's also some negatives that you should be aware of, like potentially having higher power draw and compatibility issues with SSD models. Especially on these cheaper enclosures, it's worth doing some research on what the most successful drive combos are. This Ugreen case also runs fairly cool, so no issues there, but one other option that I want to bring up is something that is kind of unique, which is this very small Hagibus enclosure that runs these tiny little 2230 NVMe drives. The cool thing about this one is it's actually made for an iPhone with MagSafe, but you can use it with both Mac and iPhone, which makes it quite versatile. For instance, say if I'm recording Apple Log video on my phone, which takes up an incredible amount of storage, I can have this plugged in and iOS will automatically record directly to the drive and then I can just plug it into my Mac and quickly transfer files over, but I can just as easily use this with pretty much any device as I see fit, so long as the operating system supports the file system of the drive itself. Now, the portable drives that I mentioned earlier will usually be pre-formatted to the XFAT file system. That's what you'll need to record Apple Log directly to an iPhone from the stock camera app, and it works across most platforms and generally performs decent enough, but there are some things that you need to be aware of with it. XFAT does not work with Time Machine backups on Mac if that's what you plan on using your drive for, and unlike the other option that I'm going to get into in a second, there's no built-in encryption or journaling, and it generally has poor recovery options. That's why I use an APFS format for almost everything, which has better overall performance and contains journaling, which, for those that don't know, journaling is essentially keeping a detailed history of everything that happens to your files, Hence the term journaling, so in the event that maybe the power goes out, the system can gracefully recover versus a non-journaled system that doesn't have any status information and is a lot more prone to corruption. The nice thing is it's relatively easy to reformat those portable drives and if you build your own with an enclosure, those come unformatted so you're going to have to go through this process anyways. But all you've got to do there is go to your disk utility on your Mac, find your drive and hit the erase button where you'll then be able to reformat it to APFS with a GUID partition map and you'll be good to go. Just be aware that that will erase anything that previously existed on the drive itself and also, outside of using a third-party compatibility tool, APFS only plays well with other Apple products, but it's still a much better overall file system if you're only using a drive within the Apple ecosystem. Also, one final thing that I want to mention about less expensive portable drives or enclosures is that on Mac, you'll want to stay away from anything marked USB 3.1 Gen 2x2 or 3.2 2x2 or anything that lists speeds at around 2000 megabytes per second because Macs do not support Gen 2x2. They'll still work, but they'll just effectively run at the speeds that we just went over. So buying something like a Crucial X10 Pro is going to be a waste of money with no real added benefit. To see an increase in performance, you're going to have to move up to Thunderbolt 3 or 4 or USB 4, which are all capable of 40 gigabit per second speeds. So around four times faster than anything that we've looked up to at this point. And while it may be tough to notice that increase in speed with most use cases, there are some areas where it can make a big difference. Transferring super large files will move a lot faster and so will a lot of real time work. Say if you're a software dev building and deploying large Docker containers, maybe you're doing complex 3D or CAD work or things like editing ProRes video at 6K and above resolutions. Basically anything where you've got these enormous real time data requirements, these scenarios 
all benefit from faster speeds. With external Thunderbolt drives, I like to stick to the enclosure style only because they're usually way more affordable and often a lot faster. And with enclosures specifically, regardless of what you're buying, you're essentially getting two main options. Products with an older JHL 7440 Thunderbolt chipset or the much newer ASM 2464PD USB 4 chipset. You'll see the JHL chipset in enclosures like this Acasis one that I used to use, and that still works fine, but for the same price these days, you can get faster enclosures like this Hyper or Zyk Drive one, which can tend to run a little bit on the hot side, which is why my current preferred model is this Ugreen USB 4 enclosure that has a built-in fan that keeps it a lot cooler. Just be aware that these need about double the power of those smaller portable drives, and especially with a fan, battery life takes a hit if you're using these with a MacBook, so they are best suited for desk setups. Drive selection also matters a lot more here as well if you want to maximize your speed. Brands do a pretty good job of letting you know which drives work best, and because there are so many based on the same chipsets, even if you're looking at other brands' compatibility charts, it's generally going to give you a good idea on what NVMe SSDs to look at. For myself, I've been using the Western Digital SN770 and Samsung 980 Pro for years with these. Both will get about 3000 megabytes per second read and write speeds and have worked fantastic with absolutely no issues, and they've both transferred a ton of data since I've had them. I edit all my videos from these drives, where I probably move close to a terabyte of data to and from them each week, and that's really reducing the mileage on my internal Mac drive. Now, more recently, I've moved on to the Samsung 990 Pro to go along with my Thunderbolt 5 enclosure, which I think at this point is the best drive available for Thunderbolt 5, and the numbers on that thing are ridiculous. Thunderbolt 5 data transfer has the potential to go up to 80 gigabits per second, so double that of anything that we've looked at here, and that's reflected in the actual drive speed itself. On this Acasis TB501 enclosure that I've got here, this has a JHL9480 chipset that you're going to see in a lot of other portable Thunderbolt 5 solutions like the OWC Envoy Ultra, but with that 990 Pro drive, I get speeds that hover around 6000 megabytes per second read and write, which is even faster than the internal drives on the Pro level Max, and this also has a built-in fan that keeps everything cool. That being said, the jump from Thunderbolt 4 to 5, even with double the speed, is going to be largely unnoticeable for 95% of people. You might see a big difference if you're editing uncompressed 4K footage at 120 frames per second or 12K and above raw footage, and also with more advanced AI or machine learning workflows, but outside of that, it's just going to be a tad faster with large file transfers and possibly things like loading games. Now, that could change as new tech comes out, but as it stands, still, let's say that you go buy a new MacBook Pro and you bump up the storage from the stock 512 gigs to 2 terabytes. That tacks on an extra 600 bucks, where this Acasis enclosure is about 240 and a good 2 terabyte NVMe drive is often under 200. So it's still cheaper, faster, and a lot more flexible. Of course, this isn't going to be perfect for everyone. You still have to lug these around with you, they can eat more battery life, and while you can transfer most apps from your Mac to these portable drives with no issues, in some cases they can behave strangely, so if that's what you plan on doing, you may face some trial and error there to get things working the way that you want. Anyway, I hope this at least gave you a solid foundation or a starting point for what to look for with external storage, and it's provided you with some value. And like I said, while I am talking about specific products here, this should translate over to most others as well. If you have found a drive or an enclosure that you really like or that you've gotten decent speeds on or performance out of that I didn't mention, please drop a comment down below so we can help each other out there, but that's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed this video or you found it useful, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech-related content, or help me build an app that translates angry keyboard mashing into inspirational quotes, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next upload.